The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of means of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is the seventh and final day of this seven-day session here at Mountain Gate in northern New Mexico in June 2020. A very interesting uh, experiment, uh, actually quite a wonderful experiment uh, since only four of us have been here in the Zendo itself and everyone else has been attending by Zoom. It's been an amazingly effective experience. Yesterday I spoke of the importance of uh, the continuing practice far beyond any initial Kensho. And I'd like to share a little bit more today, particularly from, from Yonge Mingyur Rinpoche, about some of the kinds of things that can come up as part of that process and how important it is to continue to open to even difficult feelings, thoughts, uh, experiences, and, and uh, in that way become increasingly free and it really it, it, it is amazing i discovered this process myself uh, quite a long time ago uh, having a, a history of trauma in my own life i had uh, out of self-defense uh, which is the only thing a child can do I, I i shut down and so i was able to go through the motions of living but in terms of the richness of living, uh, I, I missed out on a lot of it uh, until I got into Zen. Actually, there was a little bit earlier than that when I had my kids, it was pretty wonderful. But, but um, getting into Zen essentially took the lid off. And I, I didn't mention this in an earlier Teisho about uh, the the abuses that some so-called authorized teachers have perpetrated. Uh, this is the source of it. To have a single Kensho can, well, it will. It will free us up to a certain point. It'll take the lid off uh, some of our inhibitions. It'll, it'll kind of make it easier to kind of go about things and uh, this is a time when we have to be very careful about our behavior and really take a look at at our behavior because part of what comes up is we begin to see more clearly how we are behaving and uh, there have been a lot of uh, fake excuses and uh, misinterpreting buddhist teachings to rationalize these abuses. Not that any of you are in a position to, or would, would likely in, uh, engage in any kind of abuse, but we all have stuff. And uh, the stuff that we have for many of us is so painful and so uh, challenging uh, that we have uh, out of self-defense, shut it down, particularly if these things happen when we were children. Because children don't know how to work with these things. And most likely their parents didn't either. And while most parents are pretty well-meaning, uh, they have their own issues and their own uh, things going on. And, and children uh, may be sort of second in line. And uh, that can be extremely painful and confusing and difficult uh, and unnerving for a child. So let's um, cut to the chase and uh, share some more of this book of Yong Ming Yu Rinpoche called Joyful Wisdom, Embracing Change and Finding Freedom. Embracing change and finding freedom. And that is what we do when we do Zen practice, both. We both embrace change, at least uh, if we're really going to 
do the practice long term. And uh, of course, most people, uh, well, I wouldn't say that, but many people who start out on the path get discouraged rather fast and, and quit, which is kind of sad. But those of us who stick it out, even when it's challenging, even when it's difficult, even when it's painful, even when it's frustrating, even when we seem like it's a, it's a blank, um, we're, we're flying blind in the, in the dark, and, and is this really going to be worth it? Yes. If you take it to where you can take it, it will definitely be much more than worth it. So this is part three of this book. And the title of this section is application. In other words, he's given a lot of information ahead of this and now now it's time to get to work and here's here's about getting to work and here is a quote from the uh, Uttara Tantra Shastra which is a Mahayana uh, teaching of the Buddha the seed contained in the fruit of a mango or similar trees is possessed of the indestructible property of sprouting the seed is possessed of the indestructible power of sprouting, and that seed is within us. Of course, we're not going to become a mango tree, but the seed of the awakened beingness that we really are. In fact, it's, it's, I would say it's not, not even a seed, it's a reality, and, and it needs only to be uncovered and revealed because it cannot not be with us. And then it begins chapter 10, Life on the Path. And it starts with a quote from Sogyal Rinpoche from the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. Everything, everything can be used as an invitation to meditation. Everything can be used as an invitation to meditation. Everything can be used as a path. Every single thing that happens to us in our daily life, no matter what it is, can be used to liberate us. This is, this is the Dharma gate. All of these things. And he says, to cut through problems, we need problems. It would be cool, I guess, although having been there, I'm not sure it was so cool. Uh, if we could just sort of sail through life without um, feeling any negative um, feelings, any, any difficulty, any pain, any suffering, if we could keep a lid on that and only feel the joy, well, we can't. It's either all or nothing, as you've heard before. And if it's nothing, then it's a pretty blank and, and featureless life. And there's always a background of anxiety, subtle, but still there. To turn and, and courageously face the pain, the difficulty that we have had in our lives, or the, the emotions that come around about as a result of it is part of practice. And, and in order to become free of what is running in the background, uh, regardless of whether we look at it or not, uh, we have to see it. And it, and it will come up during practice. And that is, that is something that is challenging for pretty much everybody. It was challenging for me, but I realized that I had no choice. I could live dead, but with that uh, background anxiety, that background terror, really, 
or I could turn and face the experiences. It's not so much the experiences, it's the, the feelings and work through them and become free of them. And, and that was my choice because I didn't want to live dead. I'd already lived dead for decades. And initially what happened, and this happens if, if we have shut down uh, those painful feelings, those painful experiences, what happens is that when we start to really feel them again, they are incredibly intense because it's like going from a dark room where, where you can barely make out things and you've been surviving in this dark room for a long time and all of a sudden somebody opens the blinds and the sun comes streaming in and it's just amazing and it's also shocking. But persist and, and even that intensity will begin to soften and the aliveness that is there as a result of not shutting down is so amazing and so worthwhile. And that's how we are meant to live. So to continue, to cut through problems, we need problems. That may sound a bit strange, even radical, but in his day, the Buddha was a radical who proposed a treatment plan for suffering that differed in many ways from the options offered by some of his contemporaries. I remember as a child hearing about a tradition among hermit meditators in Tibet, men and women who spent months and often years in isolated mountain caves where they could practice for long periods without in, uh, distraction. Sounds nice, doesn't it? Well, I'm not sure it would sound, sound nice to me because you're there with your, with your demons. Um, on this line, of courage in doing what needs to be done in order to live fully. I know a woman, a British woman, who spent, I think it was 13 years in a cave, in traditional Tibetan Buddhist practice in a cave in Nepal, I think it was, before she was um, told to leave by the government. But um, of course, she's way up on a mountain and it is quite cold. The cave had a, a door. I mean, it had been fitted with a, with a, a front uh, entrance, so to speak, with a door in it. And one winter day, when she opened the door to go out and get some water, she found it uh, a, a sheet of glare ice covering the whole opening. And she realized that if she didn't do something uh, to somehow break through that ice, it was very, very thick ice. It must have uh, somehow moisture had accumulated, uh, possibly just from her own breathing, and, and, and created an, an ice prison for her. And she knew that if she didn't do something, she would die in that cave. And so she, I don't remember the exact details, but she took what implements she could uh, have in the cave uh, and managed over a period of hours to chip away at that ice and, and uh, reach a point where there was air coming in. And that's kind of how it is for us as well. We chip away at our, our own uh, cave in a, in a yearning to become free of that prison. To continue. A simple life without disturbances and a perfect situation in which to develop peace of mind, except for one detail. And here I also wanted to share with you what you may already know. Uh, Jack Kornfield, who is a foremost Vipassana teacher, Theravadan teacher in America, spent five years as a forest monk in, in Thailand in a forest monastery. In the forest monasteries in Thailand, the monks essentially live in isolated little, uh, they call them kutis, 
little, little, um, uh, I don't know what you would, how you would describe it. It's, uh, it's not so big as a shed, um, but a little enclosure where they can have uh, some shade and, and uh, perhaps uh, some protection from tigers, which roam the forest, by the way, and poisonous snakes. And, and um, they spend their days essentially alone doing their practice. And, and then uh, they gather together for mealtimes uh, in the main uh, hall, I guess you would call it, and, and uh, also to hear uh, talks by the teacher. And after five years, he felt like he had really, really come to some deep level of peace. And, and so he returned to New York City. And all of a sudden, he realized that the reason why he felt that peace was he had not had the opportunity to face his stuff, his issues. And it was such an intense experience for him that he actually went back to school and became a clinical psychologist because he could see that there was a benefit to psych psychological work and, and, and he needed to do it. And so he became trained to do it and also to, to help other people do it as well. And he is a, a foremost Vipassana teacher these days in the United States. But again, if we, if we don't have the opportunity to experience the difficult feelings, the painful memories, uh, and, and often we don't necessarily need to experience the painful memories. The, the painful feelings are usually enough. And we have a way of working with them that is very effective. The most challenging part of it is taking that step into being willing to work with feeling those feelings in your body. So back to the mountain hermits, it was too peaceful. Living alone in a mountain cave doesn't present many opportunities to grapple with disturbing thoughts, emotions, or other forms of dukkha. So every once in a while, these hermit meditators would come down from the mountains, enter a town or village, and start saying and doing crazy things. The townspeople or villagers would get so angry that they would shout at them, hurl insults at them, or even physically beat them. But for the meditators, the verbal, emotional, and physical abuse they suffered became supports for meditation. Now, we don't need to do that because we've got our built-in angry villagers right inside. As their understanding grew, their recognition of the basic situation of suffering and its causes deepened, and they developed a more acute awareness of the confusion that rules the lives of so many people. The self-created suffering rooted in a belief in permanence, independence, and singularity. Their hearts broke for these people, opening a deep and personal experience of loving kindness and compassion. They would sit for hours using some of the practices um, that are typical in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition to send the benefits they'd gained to the people who'd helped them grow by taunting and beating them. And then there is a story in America of the rabbi who for 20 years, every time he stood up in synagogue to, to speak, a man got up and heckled him. And then after 20 years, the man died. And the rest of the members of the synagogue said, geez, oh, you must be incredibly relieved. This guy is now gone. And the rabbi said, no, he was really my best friend. He showed me where I was caught. Without him, I could not have worked on stuff I needed to work on because he showed it up. And again, uh, you know, we have our best heckler right in here. Most of us aren't hermit meditators, of course. And in this respect, we're actually very lucky. 
We don't have to go looking for problems or make appointments to meet with them. We don't have to pay a cent for disturbing thoughts and emotions. Our lives are bounded by challenges of every conceivable variety. How do we deal with them? Typically, we either try to deny or eliminate them, treating them as enemies, or allow them to overwhelm us, treating them as bosses. A third option, the middle way exemplified by hermit meditators of old, is to use our experience as a means of opening to a deeper realization of our capacity for wisdom, kindness, and compassion. Our innate capacity for wisdom, kindness, and compassion, including towards ourselves. In modern Western culture, we have parents who are, are busy, uh, are otherwise uh, involved in their own lives, and may or may not be be happy to have a child. Um, we're lucky if we did have parents who were happy to have a child and the child was us. But even so, even with being happy to have a child, they are busy with trying to make a living, uh, in some cases trying to advance their own careers. And uh, especially these days, children are so often left with babysitters, sent off to daycare, and it's well known in psychology that when a child has a caregiver that is really clearly there for them, attentive, embracing, loving, compassionate, and consistent in their being there, that the child grows up uh, a, a well-rounded human being with a sort of a, a groundedness that came from that early childhood experience. And there are other situations where, for example, um, well, I think about my own son, my younger son, who um, when we moved to Burma, because my husband was a diplomat, my older son was two and a half, and, and he had already bonded with me. The younger son was born, actually he was, he would have been born in, in Rangoon, except that there was a travel freeze and the State Department wasn't sending people to their posts until six months later, five months later, actually. He was born the end of January, and uh, the end of June, we set off for going to our post in Rangoon. And several things happened. First of all, Burma was a former British colony and the British culture uh, has a, or had, I don't know how it is now, but certainly in those days, they were accustomed to sending their children off at age six to boarding school. And, uh, and if they were wealthy enough, um, and if they were wealthy enough as well, the child was, as soon as it was born, it was turned over to a nanny so that the parents could be utterly independent. And uh, the people that we replaced in Mandalay had come as a newly married couple. They lived in Burma for four years. During that time, they had two children. And the children were turned over to a nanny as soon as they were born. And uh, then they were posted back to America. Suddenly, these parents had two children, toddlers at this point, who they'd never really taken care of. And it was so overwhelming that, um, of course, the father was a, a diplomat and he had his own work every day. And the mother, uh, out of self-defense, went off and got a job. When that happens, it's a very difficult and painful experience for the child. So we arrive in Burma, and uh, it was clear that a nanny was essential. They didn't have such a thing as babysitters, and we were required uh, in the diplomatic corps to attend virtually 
every night at least one party. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. Not only that, but the parties were actually quite dreadful, but for uh, a number of reasons I don't need to get into. Um, and so we, we went to these parties and then it became known that my husband was going to be posted. We were going to be posted to Mandalay. And the, the people that were in the post uh, who were about to leave wanted us to come up and be there for a weekend. And they said, no children. And the State Department being the State Department, the Foreign Service being the Foreign Service, which has this phrase, subject to the needs of the, the State Department, we had no choice. We had to leave the kids. Uh, we'd only been in, in Rangoon for seven months and, and um, go up to Mandalay for the weekend. We came back and we found the younger one almost dying of dysentery. He wasn't a year old yet. And uh, thankfully he recovered and we moved to Mandalay and, and, and uh, were able to get a really lovely, generous, kind, compassionate nanny. The nannies all spoke English. The original nanny we had also was a wonderful grandmotherly like person, but it turns out she tested positive for TV, so we could not could not uh, hire her because it would put the kids at risk. In fact, as it turns out, the the younger one actually ended up um, testing positive for TV much much many years later. Uh, not so much positive as positive in terms of antibodies. So he'd had it and gotten over it. So we lived for almost three years in Mandalay and uh, Greg bonded with the nanny. We would spend uh, as much time with the kids as possible. And uh, we would even give the nanny uh, a couple of weeks of break uh, frequently. And when we would travel, often we would take the kids along with us, which is quite a, a wonderful set of experiences for these young kids who were toddlers at the time. They were almost three and almost five by the time we left Burma. And um, knowing we were going to leave, we kept trying to help the kids understand that Elsie, the nanny, would not be going along. We would not be able to take her. She would want to go. She loved them, but, but we, it, it wasn't going to be possible. And of course, a, a three-year-old doesn't understand these words. And we took the train down to Rangoon, flew out of uh, Rangoon back to the States when we left Burma. We were in the train car. Elsie was on the outside of the train car and the train started moving and Greg suddenly realized with enormous anguish, uh, burst into tears that Elsie was not going to be coming. And then to compound things, when we got back to the States, I ended up in the hospital. It turns out I had amoebic dysentery. And I was in the hospital for a week back then. Children were not allowed in hospitals. And my mother-in-law would bring the kids to uh, the back of the hospital where on, oh, I can't remember the fourth floor I was. I would be able to go to the window and wave to the kids when I was physically able to do that. At any rate, after a week, um, I returned to my in-law's house and Greg, wouldn't speak to me. He followed me around the, the house, hitting me every once in a while. And it was a long time before we were able to connect because he kept himself so shut down out of the pain and the rage that he was no doubt feeling uh, towards me that uh, I have had deep regrets about that there was nothing that could have been done. We did the best we could. And parents do do the best we can, uh, most parents. So we can become conditioned willy-nilly as children. 
through no real serious fault of our parents. And then, then there are parents who really are bad parents, but we won't get into that at this point. The thing is, those experiences are locked in our bodies. And Zazen begins to open us up to those old locked in feelings that we suppressed because they were too painful to experience. And so we have a choice. We can face those feelings or we can stay locked down And at some level, we yearn to be free. We yearn to live fully. And the only way I know through my own experience to do that is to courageously allow yourself to feel those feelings. And sometimes it can be basically overwhelming. Therapy makes a huge difference. I spent years in therapy. And at one point, I remember my therapist, who was quite skilled, asked me a question. I don't even remember what the question was, but it opened me up to something so painful that I bent double in anguish. But having opened to that, having felt that anguish, somehow began to free me. And I never had to feel that level of anguish again. Because finally it was out of the box. And I had felt it fully in my body. And that is what makes a difference. So continuing with uh, the Yang Ming Bure Rinpoche's words. And you remember if you heard Tasha's before when I was quoting him, or if you've read his books, that his childhood was filled with panic attacks. So typically we either try to deny or eliminate these uh, difficult feelings, thoughts, and emotions, treating them as enemies or allow them to overwhelm us, treating them as bosses. Now, allow them to overwhelm us. I'm not sure allow is the correct word because sometimes we simply get overwhelmed. A third option, the middle way exemplified by the hermit meditators of old is to use our experiences as a means of opening to a deeper realization of our capacity for wisdom, kindness, and compassion. In Buddhist terms, this approach is often referred to as, quote, taking your life on the path, close quote. Your life exactly as it is, right here, right now. The radical goal of the Buddha's treatment plan is not to solve or eliminate problems, but to use them as a basis or focus for recognizing our potential. Every thought, every emotion, every physical sensation is an opportunity to turn our attention inward and become a little bit more familiar with the source. And I don't think he's talking about the source of the pain. I think he's talking about our own source and the fact that these things are covering it up. Many people look at meditation as an exercise, like going to the gym. I'm going, I'm, uh, I got, I've gotten that over with. Now I can go out with the rest of my life. But meditation isn't something like that. It's not something separate from your life. It is your life. And this is important because we, we come to practice often thinking, okay, I'm going to meditate for so many minutes a day and I will feel lots better. And that, that will be as Rinpoche said, like going to the gym. Go to the gym, do my exercise, feel better. Um, go to the cushion, do my meditation, feel better. Okay, I've taken that pill. Now I can go out and live and have fun. But you've already heard that that time on the cushion could open up things that have the potential to allow you tremendous freedom if you're willing to walk in. I had heard years ago that uh, Trumpa 
uh, had always come into public lectures saying, leave, get out of here. If you start, you won't be able to finish. It's not going to be fun. So get out while you can. Don't start. Well, it's not that easy. In a sense, we're always meditating, focusing on emotional turmoil, disturbing thoughts, and drawing conclusions from our experiences about who and what we are and the nature of our environment. This sort of meditation often occurs spontaneously without any conscious participation. Taking our lives on the path raises the process of unconscious meditation to a conscious level. Many people, including myself, embrace this approach in hopes of finding immediate solutions for mental emotional pain. Of course, it's possible to feel some sort of relief right away, but the experience usually doesn't last very long. It's not uncommon for people to become disappointed when the sense of freedom dissolves and to think, oh, this Buddhist stuff, it doesn't work. But if we continue, beginning by just taking a few months, moments throughout the day to look at our experience and then perhaps extending our formal practice sessions, we discover that the Buddhist treatment plan is much more than psychological aspirin. As we examine our thoughts, feelings, and say sensations, we discover something precious. And then there's another quote from that same Shastra. A precious treasure is contained in each being's mind. I would say maybe it would go even further. A precious treasure is each being. We just have to uncover it. And sometimes it's very difficult and painful to uncover that. But it is worth it. So then he gets into um, an old story about an Indian man who was crossing a, a muddy field and he was carrying a little lump of gold and he dropped the lump of gold accidentally and of course it falls into the mud and and he goes on his way without realizing he's lost it and of course there's his whole muddy field uh, and it's impossible to find the darn thing and decades go by uh, lifetimes go by and, and the field is used basically as a garbage dump. So there's all kinds of trash there and it sinks into the mud and piles up as well. And then at some point, much, much later, somebody, and <laughs> the way the story goes is a god looks down uh, from above and, and says to somebody who's crossing the path there on that muddy field, uh, there's gold in there. Why don't you look for it? And how that uh, metaphor is so apt, because a lump of gold can, when it's covered by mud, look like a clod of earth or a piece of mud. And we often think of ourselves as pieces of mud, but we're not. Sure, we, we may behave in ways that we're not really proud of when we could see it clearly, but who we are, the real me, so to speak, is pure, endowed with compassion and wisdom, and far beyond that. So there's a saying in Zen, uh, to reveal pure gold, it has to enter the master's forge again and again. It's not pure until it's been smelted and all the impurities are, are melted out of it. And our meditation is what melts, melts out the, um, I don't know if I would even call them impurities because they're not impurities, they're just overlayments within our own being. Overlayments that uh, cause us to act in ways that we're not proud of. To create suffering for ourselves and for others. And this practice 
can free us. But it takes work. If we're game, and I hope everyone listening to this day show is, it is amazing what we can uncover within ourselves. And every time we see more clearly some aspect of our behavior where we're not behaving as we would really have wanted to behave, where we've expressed some uh, something dysfunctional and, and uh, been not so nice to people or caused problems, then there's a chance to work on it. And you've heard in previous day shows how we work on it. The fundamental basis of working on it is to keep going with the meditation, not to use the meditation to block out anything, but to welcome any difficult feelings, any, any, any stuff that comes up. And for example, let's take anger. Um, when, we, when we have, as children in particular, um, experienced times when we were not really honored, when we were ignored, when we longed for the love and support and recognition of our family and didn't get it, or where we got, we got it only sporadically. There is uh, an innate, in my experience, there's an innate rage that begins to arise. Because we take life, we take human life in order to be fully. And that means to live fully, and that means to live in in, uh, in a way that is honored and supported and not to be invisible. And if we are treated as if we're invisible, that is uh, basically enraging. It, it, it amounts to something like being murdered. It sounds radical, but that, that it actually feels like that. And so anger can build within us, rage can build within us, and and then we can find that all of a sudden some situation becomes a trigger and that rage bursts out in a massive uh, amount, uh, far more often than the situation would have warranted. It's because all of that rage was suppressed. And finally, it just built up to a point where it didn't take very much to burst it out into the open. It's important to do this work open to these feelings one by one as they come up so that they don't build up. And as you practice what is called radical acceptance, I don't have to like this feeling. It feels wretched. I don't like the fact that I'm feeling this way. But when we allow ourselves to experience in our body the energy that is what that feeling might be called, then there is suddenly space that opens up. And we don't have to act out. If it calls for a response, we can respond. But we don't This is very important. And this possibility only arises when we are willing to uh, let ourselves feel these painful, difficult uh, feelings, whether it's grief, whether it's rage, whether it doesn't matter what it is. There is an energy that if we tune in and we say, oh, this, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm angry or I'm uh, furious or whatever, 
it's not the words, it's the feeling, it's the bodily experience of energy. And you've heard before that when I was finally able to open up to my own feelings of anger, it felt like electricity running up and down my arms. It was exhilarating, freeing. And there was nothing that had to be done. It didn't have to be gotten rid of. And there is a, a Tibetan teaching by Long Chempa that speaks to this. Uh, if any of you want a, a copy of it, I've got it in a PDF form. It's very short. And um, some of you already know this, this quote and may even have a copy of it. But, but it is exactly what modern psychology has discovered and what in my own life, in my own practice, I have put to work. It makes so much difference. And we can all become free, no matter what's been going on. We just have to turn and face and experience, allow ourselves to feel that energy raging through. And of course, initially it's really challenging because we have kept it shut down because we didn't want to feel it. But as you continue your meditation, it will also free up your meditation. You will go so much deeper in your zazen, you will open to increasing freedom because you're not trying to keep something caught. You have this amazing capacity. You are pure gold. And every time you sit down and meditate, every time you sit down and resist trying to stuff whatever might be coming up, you're rubbing off some of that mud and beginning to reveal what's there underneath. And it is so inspiring to watch people do this. You can do it. Go for it. It'll be so worth it. Thank you for listening. We'll stop now and recite the four vows. <laughs> 